A few months ago, Matt and I successfully summited Mount Kilimanjaro, the highest peak in Africa and one of the seven summits. Which by the way, if you haven't seen those videos, we'll have links down below to both of them. You should go check them out because they're awesome. But for this video, we thought we would sit down and kind of talk through all the things that we learned before we climbed Kilimanjaro and our experiences on the mountain and what we learned there. So if you're thinking of doing your own Kilimanjaro trek, you'll be set. So Nadine mentioned it's one of the seven summits, which if you're not aware, it's the seven peaks that are the tallest on their respective continents. How'd yeah. you say it? The tallest mountains on the each on continent. each continent. Everest is probably the one you're most familiar with. That's on the Asia continent, but Kilimanjaro is on the African continent. And out of the seven summits, Kilimanjaro is definitely the easiest one to climb mm -hmm. for someone who's not an experienced mountaineer or climber or anything an like that. An amateur climber. An amateur climber. Uh, aside from the altitude, which is the biggest factor for Kilimanjaro because it sits at 5,895 Five meters, meters or 19,341 <laughs> feet, yeah. which is considered like extreme elevation. There's only half the amount of oxygen at that elevation that there is available at sea level. It's still not super easy. Like you have to be reasonably fit and mm -hmm. your hike, depending on which route you choose, might take anywhere between five to 11 days-ish and you might cover between like 60 to 100 kilometers over that time. So you're you're hiking quite a bit each day, but it's not really the physical aspect that gets most people, it's the altitude. So for the reasonings that an amateur hiker could do it, it is a very popular destination where tens of thousands of people climb it each year. Mm -hmm. So it does get pretty busy in the peak seasons. Mm -hmm. Um, that being said, you're not allowed to climb it on your own. You mm. do have to go with a tour provider and yep. have legitimate guides who are certified to be guides on Kilimanjaro and all that yep. type of stuff, which is a good thing, honestly, because it's, yeah, it's part really of it's good. for safety and um, part of it's also just to for bring employment, employment to yeah. some of the locals because it literally employs thousands of porters. But we'll touch a bit more on the tour providers later on in this video. So while it is the easiest of the seven summits, it's definitely not easy. You do need to have at least a base level of fitness um, because like we said, you're hiking for multiple days and multiple hours at a time, but you don't need to be super fit. You don't need to be like athletic definitely not, no. fit. Kilimanjaro. The biggest thing is just being comfortable walking for multiple hours, days and days in a row, like for yeah. seven days straight kind of thing. Like, yeah. like most people are going to struggle with the altitude. That is the biggest thing for sure. that people are going to be struggling with because you actually hike really slowly up Kilimanjaro. Yeah, pole pole. Very, very slow. Like I'm, I'm quite shocked at how slow. I'm and part of the reason you go so slow is because you like even if you're super fit and you can run up the di that distance in a shorter amount of time they space it out longer because they want to give your body more time to acclimatize and get used to the altitude there are all kinds of things in terms of altitude sickness there's pulmonary edema which is your lungs filling with fluid there's cerebral edema which is your brain filling with fluid um and where and then there's just other those, are the of, those are the extreme symptoms yeah. but like some people get severe headaches. Really bad headaches. Um, you get like really dizzy and you're not thinking straight. And like, you're like acting like, like you're drunk yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, literally yeah. acting like you're drunk. Yeah. Um, all of those things are altitude sickness signs. And when you start getting those, you have to go down. They won't, the guides, a good guiding company, again, we'll touch on that later, will not let you continue anymore because you could, that's when you get into the danger zone. And that is why most people do not succeed climbing Kilimanjaro. Mm -hmm. But I think if you wanted to be comfortable physically climbing Kilimanjaro, as long as you're comfortable like running five kilometers mm -hmm. at a reasonable pace without stopping yeah. or like walking 10 kilometers doing a 10K hike, yeah, 10K a couple hike. days in a row kind of thing, um, I think yeah. you'd be fine. Yeah, so we hiked in the beginning of February and we booked our trip in the beginning of November. It was like end of October, November. So we had a roughly three months to kind of train and we weren't that we were successful terrible. at we training. We didn't get much done. Yeah. No, I mean, like, it's not like we were huge hikers before. We've done hikes before, so we're, we're at least a little bit fit to a degree, but we just did local hikes around our mountains as much as we could for November, because after that, it's all snowy in Canada, so we couldn't hike 
anymore. Uh, so we just did like a three hour hike, a two hour hike, an or hour Or just hike. short runs on a treadmill to yeah. just help work the cardio kind of thing. And then a lot of quads. And for me, I actually felt yeah. it was fine. Like physically, my legs were fine. The biggest thing that I struggled with was actually my cardio. So I wish that I did a bit more cardio work. So that was the amount of training that we did going into it. Some people Not very much. don't train at all. Some people train for a lot longer than that. Yeah. Um, if you've never done any kind of like big hiking or camping trip before, you might want to do some sort of hiking or camping. Yeah, <laughs> like obviously we this. can't tell you how much you need to train before yeah. you climb Kilimanjaro. You have to kind of just know yourself and what you're capable of. And another important consideration when you're planning to climb Kilimanjaro is when you are going to climb, what time of year, because mm -hmm. there are two distinct dry seasons, which are the busiest times, obviously because they are the best times to climb. You don't want to climb in the wet season. It can get a lot of rain. It'll be miserable. Mm -hmm. And just from like our experience, it gets very, very muddy and gross. Like, yeah, yeah, you don't And when there. you're on the mountain, um, like once your stuff gets really wet, it's hard to dry back out again because you don't really get the hot temperatures when you're at that altitude. That's why most people climb in the dry season. You can still climb in the wet season, but not every tour provider offers it. I don't know how many do. Some will completely not, some will. I'm sure if you looked, you could you could find somebody to take you up there in the wet season, but just I would avoid yourself. it. It's gonna be very yeah. wet if you do that. So December to mid-March is one of their most popular dry seasons. That's where we went in beginning of February. And then there's the rainy season between April and May. That's usually the rainiest season. It's the big rainy season, mm -hmm. yeah. And then they have another dry season from June to September. I, I think August, September is supposed to be like the busiest time of year. So if you don't want crazy crowds on your hike, you might want to try to avoid those two months unless you want like the best chance at dry or weather. Or that just might be the time of year that works for you. Exactly. So that's what happens. Yeah. But those are your two seasons, so pick something kind of in between then, and you should have hopefully good weather. Another popular option is a full moon summit. It's something a lot of tour providers offer. It's something that we actually ended up doing. We opted for the full moon summit, which means our summit night, which is our nighttime in the dark climb, was during a full moon. Um, the idea is that you get more light and yeah. you can see a bit more. You have to rely less on your headlamp. But honestly, I don't really know how much it helped. I don't either. It was still quite dark to the point where you needed a headlamp. And so I don't yeah. really know how much of it. It, it, it was pretty seeing the full moon. But yeah, I didn't even look up. <laughs> so I genuinely, I don't even think I looked up. I was just so focused on like each step in front of me. But a better, like a good headlamp will do you much better than the Choosing. little bit of moonlight that you get. Yeah, for a yeah. full moon summit. It's and also you, really busy on full moon summits yeah, too. For that it's, reason. It's quite popular, yeah. Now there's actually seven main routes to climb up Kilimanjaro and they all vary in length, in difficulty, in duration, in success rate, in natural beauty, and in price. So, and you um, might be tempted to take one of the shorter routes because it'll most likely be cheaper and get you to the summit sooner. But um, like we said earlier, acclimatization is a big thing. And the more days you spend on the mountain, your chances of summiting go up like quite drastically. So there's a couple of reasons why different routes cost different prices. The biggest thing is park fees. Park fees are ridiculously expensive. So the longer the route, the more park fees you need to pay for each day you're on the mountain, as well as you're paying for your porters and your food, etc. So obviously the longer routes are gonna be more expensive than the shorter routes but there's pros and cons to each. Definitely. So the shortest route that you could take up the mountain is the Marangu route, which is a five day trip, but it is, uh, there's a lot of pro there's a lot of cons. It used to be the most popular route, but it has actually a lower success rate than many of the other routes because it's a short period of time. It's only five days typically mm -hmm. that the Marangu route is done in. It is the most established route and one of the oldest routes on the mountain and it does have huts built at each campsite, yeah, so you're which is not, one of the pros. Definitely you're not sleeping pros. in tents. And if it is raining, then at least you're in a, a hut and not a tent. Yeah, but because it's the shortest, you have the least amount of climatization and acclimatization, acclimatization and altitude huge. sickness is gonna be the biggest factor of you not successfully summoning. 
maybe you have experience with altitude before mm -hmm. and you seem to react okay, then maybe you'd be fine on the Moringa route. Yeah. But it is kind of a risky chance to take if you've never been to altitude before and if you're not used to that sort of thing. Mashame route is the most, probably the most popular route. I think at the it's the moment. most popular route now. Yeah. And it is the route that we chose mainly because it was the best for our dates and we really liked the time. So we did a seven day Mashame, but you can do anywhere between a six to an eight day Mashame route. I think so, you can do an eight. Yeah. You can definitely do a six. You can definitely do a six. I think you can do an eight. But the nice thing about Mashame route is that it kind of strikes a balance between not being so long and expensive and not being so short and having a lower success rate. And mm -hmm. it's also still a very scenic route and so it, it kind of strikes a good balance between. It also has a lot of acclimatization built in. Yes. So you hike high, which is why and then it has a high success low. rate. That appealed most to us, even though we knew it was going to be a very busy route. That is one of the cons of that route is because it has all these wonderful things yeah. about it. It's very popular, and we can definitely attest to it being very, very popular. The mountain was. Very busy. Now, another route that was our second choice was La Mosha route. And it's also a very, very popular route. It comes highly recommended. And it's typically about an eight day yeah. route. And it does a slightly different, but it's also supposed to be really scenic and yeah. really good with acclimatization and with like it, a high success rate. It starts further in the West. Yeah. And so the La Mosha and the Machame route meet up uh, after the lava tower at Barranco camp, I believe. Yeah, I think so. I think it's Barranco camp. Um, just giving yourself another day or two on the mountain mm -hmm. gives you even a higher chance of success. And um, it's supposed to be the most scenic route on the mountain, at least according to some people. Mm -hmm. The only reason we really picked the Machame route over the Lamosho was mainly because of the dates worked yeah, a the bit better for us. Yeah, the dates worked out better for it. Um, yeah. yeah. Both of those are really good, highly recommended. Another quieter route that's also highly recommended is the Northern Circuit route. Now this is typically a more expensive one because it's longer. So I it think- It can be up to like 11 days. Yeah, 11 days, which is quite Maybe a even lot. longer with some tour providers. Possibly. But it's a, it, it actually starts off the same as the Lamosho route. And then I think around the lava tower, it circles around the Northern side of the crater. That means that it is the longest route on the mountain, which means it also has the highest summit success rate because you spend so much time acclimatizing, you have a much higher chance of making up the mountain. Yeah. So if making it up the mountain is your number one goal and you wanna have all of your cards aligned, then Northern Circuit is gonna give you the best chance. Yeah, if you're gonna afford to spend <laughs> gonna a little bit more money it. and also just have that extra time on the mountain, yeah. like a lot, almost two weeks or like 11, 12 days on yeah. the mountain. Another recommended one would be the wrong guy route, which is special in its own way. So it's usually what, what, eight days? Um, eight, nine days maybe. Yeah. And it's the only route that actually approaches Kilimanjaro from the north, mm -hmm. uh, which has less vegetation on that side. So it might be slightly less scenic, but the reason why it has less vegetation is because it gets significantly less rain than the southern slope of Kilimanjaro. So if you are hiking in like one of the shoulder seasons and it might be rainy, wrong guy route would be a really good option. Yeah. Um, it's also way less crowded than the other routes. Mm. Uh, so if you want to be on your own and you don't want to be in the crowds, wrong guy would be a really good option. Yeah, because Lamosha was still, I think, pretty busy as Lamosha well. Lamosha is still quite busy. Yeah, yeah, same with Morangu and Machame. All Those three are the busiest of the yeah. routes. So wrong guy and Northern Circuit are really your routes if you just want to avoid crowds. And there are going to be crowds. Yeah, regardless. There are going to be crowds. You'll encounter people of the summit probably yeah. too anyway. So like, 100%. It's a busy mountain, guys. It's a busy mountain. It's a busy mountain. There are two other like established routes, which are Shira and Umbwe. Umbwe is just very steep, so it's quite a difficult route. They don't really recommend it if you haven't hiked up the mountain before. I think it's also a five day-ish route. So, so it's fast, it's steep, it's yeah. really difficult, not recommended. Nope, and same thing with Shira. Shira's a bit outdated. because It's, it's kind of similar to the Lomosho route, yeah. um, but you start hiking at, I think it's like three and a half thousand meters or something, Ooh. which is already pretty high it's to already start altitude. hiking at. Yeah. Um, so it's also not super recommended. You know, just do the Lamo show if you want to yeah. start on the western side and have that scenery. So stick to those four. Those are your four best options. There's also the rest Western Breach route, mm -hmm. which uh, only some tour providers offer, and it's been closed several times in the past due to accidents and slope instability. It so, was closed when we were there. Like the Western Breach was closed when we were there. Yeah. So um, it might be open now, but 
Sudeti. Hakuna matata. Kama tena jambo. Jambo bwana. Choosing the right tour provider for your Kilimanjaro hike is a very very important big decision that's going to affect literally your entire trip. So you want to do a lot of research and read a lot of reviews. Don't cheap out. Don't cheap out. And there's a couple different reasons for this is because the cheaper tour providers tend to not have the best equipment, the best guides, the best food, or pay their people, the porters, the ones carrying your stuff up the mountain, a living wage. Yeah, so what you, one of the things you really want to look out for is that your tour provider is KPAP certified. And KPAP is the Kilimanjaro Porters Assistant Project, I believe. It is a nonprofit organization that advocates for fair wages and the proper ethical treatment of their porters. Yeah, so they set like a standard rate that the porters should get paid per day. And to become KPAP certified, the companies have to adhere to those standards. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the wage, it's also their conditions on the mountain, making sure they actually have a tent. Believe it or not, but some tour providers don't require that their porters even have tents. They sleep outside. And these people are like <gasps> literally carrying your stuff up the mountain. And like we wouldn't have made it up there without our porters yeah. and without our crew. So like, it is shocking the amount of work that the porters do. Yeah. You want to make it sure they're fairly compensated. It was important to us that they were compensated for their work, for sure. Yeah, so one of the ways that you can find a tour provider is you can go to the KPAP website and then you can actually see the list of all of the tour providers that are certified and then you can go from there. Like we said before, you can't hike Kilimanjaro on your own. You have to go with a group. But you have the option of doing a public group or a private group. Now with a public group, you can just join any open group that uh, various tour providers have and their group sizes range. There's quite a drastically. <laughs> yeah. Like our group was only seven people, but I've seen some groups that were 20 plus, which seven is crazy. Hikers, seven hikers. Yeah. But that didn't mean that was our whole group size because for seven hikers, we had one lead guide, two assistant guides, a cook and 24 porters. <laughs> 24 so it was 28 porters. people in our crew. For seven hikers. For seven hikers. Now, so you can imagine the, the groups that are like 20 hikers that have 100 plus in their crew. It gets crazy, the amount of people. Yes, so you wanna make sure you know the size of your group when you are selecting that. You can just email, you can ask your tour provider what their group sizes are, but seven was a really good size. It's nice to have the company of hike, like when you're sitting around eating dinners and lunches and snacks, it's nice to talk to somebody. It's nice to talk to people on the hike as yeah. well. So these are some of the benefits of joining an open group tour. And that's kind of why we chose to do an open group is we wanted to enjoy the experience with other people. And everybody in our group was so amazing. So and we amazing. were all so supportive of each other. If anybody needed something, like somebody else in the group might be able to help in some way yeah. and they would offer to help. So it's it definitely has benefits going with an open group. And we packed way too many, <laughs> way too many hand warmers. Hiking Kilimanjaro is expensive. It's, it's, it's definitely not cheap. <laughs> it's not cheap. Yeah. Not only you gotta get there, which is gonna be an expensive plane ticket, uh, if you don't have the equipment even, mm -hmm. like that you could have a lot of equipment that you need to buy. They do offer equipment rentals in Moshi, Tanzania. If yes. you have next to nothing and you don't plan on doing any hiking trips in the future, or if you just need a couple items. Which is what we did. We rented hiking poles and we rented sleeping bags so we didn't have to pack those with us. Yeah. But of course, if you have your own, you can bring that as well. We're gonna touch more on packing and what to pack for Kilimanjaro in our next video that comes out. So if you wanna know about that, be sure to keep an eye out for that. Click that subscribe button, hit that bell so you'll know. But, but uh, it is expensive and it's an expensive mountain to climb. So a good tour provider might run you $2,000 per person, uh, depending of course on the route that you take. Mm -hmm. uh, it could go up from there. It might be a little bit cheaper than that for some routes, but um, anything less than that and you're getting into the tour providers that might have inferior equipment, food, and might not be KPAP certified. Mm -hmm. We spent 2,700 US dollars per person to hike. And that was on the seven day Machame route. Mm -hmm. um, and that does not include the tips, which is something you need to account for as well. So yeah. there's the tour provider price and then there is the tips that you pay on top uh, to your to all of your amazing porters the whole and crew. the crew which truly are 
amazing. They went above and beyond. So yeah. they're worth each of those tips. And you want to make sure you tip them well and you tip them good. So you could also expect to spend between maybe like 200 to 400 US dollars in yeah. tips, again, depending on the route, because the tips are usually calculated um, per crew member mm -hmm. per day on the hike. And honestly, that might sound like a, mo a lot of money in tips, but when you look at the breakdown, it's only like $5 to each porter per day on the mountain. Yeah, it's not and a whole lot. And the fact that they're doing so much work, it's really not that much money when you think about it that way. Yeah, and and so any of the tour, any good tour provider will give you a breakdown of how much you can expect to bring for tips, and they'll let you know that before you even go up the mountain, so you can take out cash, which you don't take up the mountain, by the way. You you leave all of your cash in the hotel, any hotels you stay at before you go, which is an important thing to note. You want to make sure you book a good hotel uh, in Moshi before you go hike up the mountain, because any of the good hotels, most of the typical hiking hotels will be able to store your luggage, which is which, or your valuables, your valuables and everything. Or your cash. They don't recommend bringing any cash up the mountain. But also a lot of tour providers will book your hotel on the night before your climb and the night after your mm -hmm. climb as well. So you won't have to really worry about doing that. But we spent in total about what? It was like just over 3,000 US dollars per person for our seven day Machame route hike. Yeah. Um, and that was with a good tour provider. We went with uh, Can Do Adventures. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like sponsored or anything. No. We just, but they were really good. Um, yeah, they were really good. We really enjoyed them. Really happy with their service. Our guides, our cook, our, our, <laughs> our porters, they were all amazing. Yeah, but obviously there are many other tour providers. So pick which ones you like and which suit you. Another important thing not to forget is vaccines and medications that you will need. For your trip. For your trip. So there are a couple standard ones that you need just for Tanzania in general. One being yellow fever. Yeah, this is one, I'm not sure if it's the same for all nations and nationalities, but we, it was mandatory for us and they can actually check to see if you have it. They did check. They checked when we went through the border in Kenya. Right. So that one's an important one. Yeah. Um, malaria is another one that you're gonna need. Highly, highly <laughs> recommended. So, cause you start in the rainforest, as annoying as it is, you have to be on malaria pills. We were on malaria pills and they're not an enjoyable experience. Well, some people don't actually have much of a reaction to the pills, but we did have some digestive issues from the pills. Yeah, even so. though the actual mountain itself, you're in a higher elevation. Once you're out of the rainforest, there's no mosquitoes, but you are in the rainforest when you start and when you end, so you still need And to even in just pills. like the town before yeah. your hike starts and afterwards, you could still mm -hmm. be encountered by mosquitoes, so. And then the last big one. Now there are a couple other ones that you might need, but that'll be specific to you. Of course, we always recommend travel, talking to a travel doctor before at least six weeks before you go yeah. to make sure you have the proper shots and medications and they can help you with all of this. Yeah, obviously we're not doctors or anything like that. <laughs> no. So talk to a professional that knows their stuff and they'll be able to tell you exactly what you need and what you don't need and what they recommend mm -hmm. and all that stuff. But then when it comes to altitude specific, Diamox is the typical name for it. There are other names, but altitude sickness pills. Yeah, I think it's essentially typically it sold under the brand name Diamox. Mm -hmm. Acetazolamide, I think is the name of the pill. Um, we both took it and only one person in our group didn't take yes. Diamox and he did have the most symptoms of altitude sickness. There's a lot of discussion around Diamox and all we have is our personal experience with it. Some people take it, some people don't take it, some say it helps them, some say it doesn't. Now some of the side effects from Diamox and one of the reasons why people choose not to take it is because one, it makes you go pee. A lot. Yes. But my my reasoning that like, that's not that big of a deal anyways, no, because you're, you're gonna be drinking like so three to four liters water. a day anyways. You're gonna be peeing every half an hour anyways. Yeah, so, like, like you have to drink. They make you drink three to four liters of water a day. It's so important. What are the two big rules? Drink, keep hydrated, pole pole. Which means slowly, slowly. Slowly, slowly. Yeah, drinking and water helps boost the oxygen levels in your blood, which is really, really important. Um, and if your blood level oxygen dips 
down too low, they'll actually send you down the mountain. So you you want to be drinking water for sure. Yeah, and Lots they're constantly it. monitoring your like your blood oxygen saturation and every your pulse day. every morning, every evening. Again, not every tour provider might not do this, but the good ones will. The good ones will, and any tour provider you're going with should do it. Like yeah. <laughs> if your tour provider is not monitoring your health vitals then that's that's a red flag for a tour provider in yeah. my opinion and it's at least for us as canadians it wasn't an expensive pill no but of course it depends on your health care and all that stuff and then the other major side effect which is something that i did experience quite a bit was the tingling so your, yeah. your fingers like your toes feel tingly feet. my face got tingly like here it was really bizarre it was like like it wasn't like painful or anything, no. but it's just a weird feeling. Another thing that I took specifically, and this is more for, for me, not necessarily for you, and I would make sure you talk to like a doctor or somebody before doing this, is iron supplements. Uh, I'm anemic, so I naturally take iron supplements, but I made sure I was on it, taking on them on a regular <laughs> very, basis while we we're on the mountain. Very, very yeah. adamant about taking iron supplements. That was at least a month before to make sure I increased my iron level in my blood and I was taking them up on the mountain and I had a really high blood oxygen count. I think one of the highest in the group, if not the highest. Yeah, it was, at it a was lot of points. really, really yeah, high. It was consistently higher than mine. Not saying that, that that's the reason, the reason, but for it's something to look into if you are anemic or if you have lower blood oxygen saturations, not that you would typically know that because who knows that? And then another thing that you're gonna wanna take is just Advil and Tylenol, yes. paracetamol, ibuprofen, whatever you want to call it. Um, because chances are you will get headaches or you might get cramps if you're not used to hiking that long or whatever, whatever the case. Headaches is a very common one. Very, with very common. So you definitely want to have some Advils. Yeah. So that's all there is for this video. We do have two more videos planned. We have a packing guide coming up next. So that's everything we packed for our trip and how you want to pack for Kilimanjaro as well as our Q and A. So if we didn't answer your questions in this or you don't think it'll be answered in the packing guide. Or if you just have general questions about our experience and anything else that might not be in these videos. Mm -hmm. Feel free to ask them down below in the comments and we'll get to as many as we can. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you'll know when those videos come out. Hit that little bell and um, go watch the Kilimanjaro vlogs if you haven't. Yeah, they're pretty awesome. Okay, bye. Bye.